Well, hello and welcome to the Alpha Anywhere demo and Q&A webcast. I'm Dave McCormick, I'm VP of Products and Services here at Alpha Software, and I am pleased to welcome back Dion McCormick, no relation, who is our lead solutions engineer who has been on vacation. So you can ask him questions about uh, Alpha Anywhere today, but you can also ask him questions about Cape Canaveral, which is where he's been. So we'll, we'll take both sorts of questions. Anyway, uh, as always, Dan is going to give a short demo at the beginning of today's presentation. I believe he's talking about uh, checkboxes. And then later on, he's here to answer your questions. So go ahead and type your questions into the questions box of the GoToWebinar control panel. So hello, Dion, are you there? Yes, indeed. Hello there, Dave. Good to be back. Let me make you the presenter. Cool, cool, cool. And, there you and are. I, I, sorry, I have to correct you. It's the Kennedy Space Center. Not Cape Crown. Now that's oh, it, it is. what it's it used to be called, called but yeah. yep. the official name is so just because we need to be official and precise. No, it is really amazing trip. Just phenomenal. Um, and I want to say thank you, everybody, for joining us. We I've missed you. It's been a, a good time off, just kind of re-energize. And what's cool is during that time, we got new releases, new features, new capabilities. So we have a lot to cover. Uh, as always, we love your questions. Please go to the GoToWebinar control panel, go to the questions section and add your questions there. Uh, we'll be monitoring there and we'll do everything in our power to mon to answer those. Uh, also, remember, you can always send them to guides at alphasoftware.com. We got one just in right before, and I'm not sure if we can cover it, but uh, we, if possible, give us a little time there before our weekly webinar. But uh, go to guides or email guides at alphasoftware.com, and that will allow us a little time to be prepped and be able to answer. In fact, our demonstration today came from a lot of user requests and uh, really want to talk about uh, what we're capable of doing in the new list control as the list control continues to mature. So we'll cover that there. Um, before I jump into it, I um, also want to say thank you to Sarah for joining us today. Uh, we also have a little quick update on iOS styling. Um, I had been giving some, I'm not going to say incorrect, but say dated information, which could be considered incorrect. So we want to kind of do a quick follow up on that to make sure you have the latest and greatest information. There's no confusion as the team and the development group continues to improve thing. And they have so many cool things like in the hopper that are being built that it's just crazy how it's hard to keep up with all the things they're going. And all of them are built around making your life easier, making your applications more powerful, uh, easier to build, more flexible, and allow you to be super successful. Um, real quick also, remember we have our Transform Tuesdays on Tuesday, hosted by our esteemed colleague Dave here. Any updates on Transform Tuesday that have uh, been covered, been following these days? Lots of stuff going on in Transform. There is a lot, but I did not do a Transform Tuesday <gasps> yesterday. I was very busy completing the last um, chapter or so far the last chapter yeah, yeah. of the user's guide for transform which includes the transform programming language so that is uh that's ready to excellent review and actually i'll paste the link to that in the chat window for this if please you do this is an amazing yeah. document this document is so cool and if you know it's really people who have been using this document along with transform are just digging it so it's a really Awesome, awesome capability. And I, I'm going to say, yeah, there is no last chapter, given the way our development group works. So you, you write that last chapter and then... <laughs> There's not going to be exactly, yeah. It's like a Robert Patterson novel. It just never ends. They just, you know, <laughs> got to come on out. Like, you know, so ghost writers and everything else to keep the, the money flow going. I, I don't think all these writers write this stuff anymore. They just basically put their name on the front cover anymore and hire a bunch <laughs> of starving artists to write it. So very cool. So... um. Today, again, uh, for demonstration, um, we're going to do an update on iOS in a second, but I wanted to dive in and show a new capability inside the latest release. And if you haven't noticed, you've been getting notices, we have a new updated production release. Uh, so uh, remember, uh, that's official, so you can use that. And uh, I always tend to use different virtual machines to test things out and make sure it's all good, especially if it's pre-release. So I'm going to pop over into my environment here. So the first thing I want to show you here is that um, there was a capability in the grid control, and let me go ahead and do the, show you an example of that. And I'm in the alpha development environment. I'm going to open up my grid control here, and we'll select my connection string. And I'm going pretty quick here, just assuming people know what to do here, and I select some fields. Okay, and we'll move those over. We'll say customer list. 
100. Okay. So I'll do my work in preview and voila, I have a grid. Now, one of the cool capabilities, and notice I'm using the more modern styling, which looks awesome here. Um, one of the coolest capabilities of the grids for a long time is I could go to properties here. And again, as you know, there's like a bajillion, and that's a technical term, uh, and a bajillion is more than a Google, just to let you know. So I'm gonna go search properties here. Often it's like there, uh, but I actually can see it right here. You'll notice right here, there's one called as checkbox select column. So I'll enable that. And I'll go back into my working preview here. And voila, I have a cool little checkbox that allows me to make non-contiguous uh, capabilities and also a checkbox up here to say huh, select all and so built into the grid component was a very powerful capability which is the checkbox control and the nice thing is then you could there were also pre-built capabilities where like I could say okay just print a report or just do an export of the records of only the things I've checked which is really powerful for your end users you always want to give your users flexibilities meaning you want them to be able to uh, basically um, select what they want and you don't have to think of every different condition you say I'm just going to give them a checkbox and if they're doing a weird mailing or something like that and they got to go to this person this person this person voila they can filter it on these checkboxes and then do a report or an export or whatever they happen to do very handy very thing and so there's a lot of requests for this equivalent capability for a list so I'm going to go ahead and show you the new uh, list checkbox capability. If anything, it's more powerful because of the list inherent capabilities. So I'm in a UX control. Very important is lists exist in UX controls and UX and lists are data controls. So I'll go list, uh, list, checkbox, okay. And I'll go on here and I'll go to my connection string, very similar to what we did there before. We try to keep consistency. So I'll invite these kind of things here. And so I've got my list here. And in fact, you know what? Let's make this look pretty decent. So I'll go ahead and put in a panel card around that. And I'll make this thing the fill container so it expands. So now I've got my list, very similar to a you know grid. And uh, you'll notice the column or format here. And again, I have a lot more styling and not more, you know, it's it's gonna load faster than a grid. It's lighter weight and it's fast and a lot of styling capabilities you can do. So now what I wanna do is enable the same capabilities. So I'm gonna go into my list checkbox. Let me go ahead and go list CB underscore UX, save that. Um, let's go into our checkbox. So I can do that, or my list, excuse me. I can do that by double clicking here or over on the right hand side, we can click list properties. And now I'll go to list properties within list properties, which show you all those different things. Like, is there a header, footer, etc.? cetera? And we're gonna scroll down here. And so what I'm gonna do is first, I'm gonna enable a very important capability which is called allow, where's my uh, multi-select? So I'm gonna enable multi-select. And the way I'm gonna do multi-select is on a click event. But you'll notice we also have a new feature down here that says has checkbox select control. So I'm gonna enable that. And there is some high, uh, control customization. I'll come back and talk about that in a few moments. Uh, this is really where it very much distinguishes itself from the grid component because the grid component had a certain level of customization, but it was very minimal. Save this bad boy, and we'll go ahead and do a working preview, and voila, wait, we go. oh, I missed a step, bad Dean. I have gone to my list properties. Did this this morning too, geez, I can't believe it. Uh, so I have my checkbox, checkbox select control, but I still need to go to my list layout because I haven't told it what to show because I may not want to show it. So I can go in here and say, oh, check that out. So since I've enabled the checkbox capability, you will notice now that we have a new field here. I have my data fields. These fields are different fields that are kind of built in, um, logical row number, et cetera. These are kind of handy if you want to show information, do other things with JavaScript. But I'm going to go ahead and click the checkbox select and add that. And I'll put that at the first of it. And that's where I screwed up. I did not add that. So I'll click OK. Go ahead and save this. I always save so I can recover very quickly. Go into my working preview. And now we have, voila, a checkbox. And you'll notice it works very similar to there. 
is I've got the ability to do individual. So I can now very with just click, 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 before you had to kind of do little special things, now you have the ability to add a checkbox list. And that's super important. There's always cases where you wanna be able to select uh, discontiguous uh, items and be able to do those kind of things and then maybe take an action on that. Now, the really cool thing is I have a lot of capabilities built into this so I don't have to become a brilliant designer, although that's always good to have. I'll go back into my list checkbox, checkbox. I'll go to my list properties, and I'm gonna go down here to checkbox select control customization. So now I'm gonna go ahead and open that, and now I have all of my different customizations that I'm able to modify. So let's let's just do a few here. So what is the un unchecked SVG icon fill color? So this basically allows you to change the coloring of the different icons. Uh, and you'll notice you have unchecked information and checked. So let's just have some fun. So the stroke color, I'm gonna change that to unchecked, I'm gonna keep it as black. But I'm gonna go here to my stroke color which is, and uh, I'm gonna change that to something like a red, okay? And let's just take a look real quick and see what that looks like. And now you'll see, does it change? No, I must not. Oh, let me try the fill. Let me do the fill one. That's gonna be a little bit more visible. I think stroke is a little differently. And this is where you do a little, this is the fun part because you can kind of play with it and change it real quickly. So let's go ahead and make the fill color also red. Okay, and we'll go back to this. Now notice, check that out now, which is cool. Like let's say you had a, um, like errors you're trying to indicate. Well, a red checkbox is much more impactful and much more visible to a certain person than a black one. You know, it just shows, oh man, we got these errors here. And guess what? You can set these checkbox levels, you know, programmatically. So you can use them for many different reasons. I'm using it as a selector methodology, but it's very easy for me to add that and be able to do it also with program programmatically. So I'm going to go back in here and I want to do something a little more interesting is that the other benefit is that currently we're using the default SVG. And, and for people who are familiar with it or new, it's uh, scalable vector graphics. It's basically a way to represent versus having images of icons, you can use SVG. And there's a great website. Let me go ahead and show you while we're doing this here. I think it's flat icon. I always get that. Might be all one word. A little slow internet here. Oh, nope. Flat icon. There you go. I am human. Okay. <clears throat> There's a great website called flaticon.com. And see, you can see there are a whole bunch of free icons. You can also pay for them and it depends on the different licensing. But there are so many cool ones you can use. And these are all free. They're very simple. You can go in and look at them and pick out the different elements that are associated with them, and then they'll give you SVG for each of these. And since they're scalable, they can be small and large, meaning I can scale them on my screen so that they look great on a phone or on a website, however it happens to be. And you can actually go back and search for different types too. You can say, I need stuff that's in the um, construction. Let's try construction. There's 55,000 icons that are available if you're doing construction work. So if I do that, it's gonna do a little quick search. And it comes back. And they're also, which is kind of cool, they're sold in packs. So you have packs that have consistent coloring and consistent structure and layout and look. So you have a nice feel. Um, but as you can see, there's tons of different ones that are involved in the construction industry. And you're able to make very nice looking stuff. So I can go in here now. And I'm going to go ahead and you'll see you can use default SVG. You could also use a bitmap. You're not limited to SVG, but tend to we really recommend that you use SVG just because of the scaling and it looks really good and you don't have to worry, worry about like your bitmap's too small, you know, so there's some fun stuff. But you can also select here custom. And then uh, with the custom, that allows you to um, set your own icon and other pieces along those lines. So it's really fun you can go in and create the different types of icons 
to do that, including custom, which is really, really cool. The other thing that you can do is right here, you can say has check, uncheck all control and column header. So I'll go ahead and click here and click OK. And let's just go ahead and show that. So I'm going to working preview. And then we'll see here. So you notice we now have a column up here and boom, I can immediately highlight all of those things at one time. So if you're like a basically a select all kind of feature and capability within there. Uh, so really handy, this new check, I really like it because I, there's many times I've been using it for people in their applications and it's just a great to have your tool. And the nice thing is that it is now built into the list control before you had to kind of create your own custom column and do your own thing. Now you can do it with merely a click, 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 and you're good to go. Um, the other thing that's nice is that it's um, styling wise, it looks really good. You'll notice that if I go back to my grid, I really, I, there was some changes, but it was kind of limited in terms of what the style could be. Whereas with this, you can use any kind of bitmap, you can use any kind of SVG, and you can make it look really nice. I mean, it just looks sharp. Very, very nice in terms of its look and feel. And guess what, which is kind of cool, is checkboxes work. Uh, currently, you'll notice in my list layout here, we are using what's called a columnar list layout type. So that, but you can also use it for freeform. You can't use it with Kanban and the other ones, but it works with column and freeform. And so with freeform, you can have checkboxes that are built in. So you have complete styling control. It doesn't have to be a grid like interface, it can be you know, more of a traditional, and you can still have the ability to have a checkbox and lay it out, put it where you want. So from a flexibility standpoint, uh, styling wise, it just destroys the grid in terms of styling capability, but has all the nice features that are associated with it from that standpoint there. So that is the new and improved list checkbox functionality. Very cool, very fun. Um, let me go ahead and grab this website here and put that into the I'm going to put that into the chat window there we go okay cool now uh, what I'd like to do at this point is turn it over to Sarah for a few moments here um, again a, a couple weeks ago someone was talking about iOS because in iOS with the advent of the iPhone X it has the infamous or phenomenal or however you want to look at it notch that's at the top of the screen so let me go ahead and show you here i go iphone x notch and you can see that in an image here there's a good image of it right there <coughs> excuse me because of the sensors because that whole face capability is built into the sensors right here where you have like an led that sprays thirty thousand dots on your face actually this is a great look at it so you can see they have like a bunch of sensors in here the dot projector throws like uh, thirty thousand dots over your face and then they use information like uh you know flood illuminator infrared camera all this stuff to then do that facial recognition stuff but the issue is you have this notch that comes on the screen. So the screen goes up here and here. So in that case, there's a lot of questions about when you do a standard one, um, and I'll go here to kind of show you, this is kind of your safe area because you know if you make your screen too tall, it will interact with that. But the team, the development team uh, understood that. They, were, they had some initial styling templates and stuff. But recently, they've been really making it so easy for you to build iPhone X. And so I'm going to actually turn this over to Sarah for a few moments to kind of show you where you can get the information and how you can make an effective, um, you know, so you can see here, this is kind of, you know, you want it to look like this, not some kind of weird stuff. Um, although I guess they want to do that. But, you know, if you do this, sometimes you'll lose certain content and stuff like that. So. Uh, Sarah, if you don't mind, or Dave, we'll move that over to Sarah, and she can go through those elements. Yep, sounds good. I will pass over the controls. Okay, Sarah, I've made you the presenter, but you appear to be muted. Dun, 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 Sarah, dun. are you there? Not uh -oh. hearing you. Uh oh, not. I'm not seeing a yellow something. 
Yeah, what is the yellow? I think that means that she's the presenter. I think that there that you go. Oh, I see an audio. There we go. Can you hear me? Hello, we can. Sarah. All right. Sorry about that, guys. No. Um, what do you need? The um, <laughs> the iPhone stuff. The iPhone X stuff, yeah. iPhone X stuff. All right. So I just wanted to mention this. I put the links in the chat window earlier, but we had talked about briefly a couple of weeks ago about iPhone X styling, and there is a checkbox in the UX control that will add all the CSS for you, but there are some other things you might need to do to make your application compatible. And so I wanted to let you guys know about this guide, this styling phone gap apps for the iPhone guide. Definitely go through this and read it. Um, we have a template that shows a number of things you can do with the status bar and the header. Um, and so that's that's all built in, uh, definitely worth digging into. And then while I have you guys here, I figured I'd also point out the new WK WebView engine, which we've put together as a replacement for the UI WebView, which Apple has deprecated. And it will, the UI WebView will go away eventually someday. Uh, we don't know when. Uh, it could, they could choose to pull it tomorrow. They could choose to pull it in 10 years, uh, but it is deprecated and they, they are no longer supporting it. So moving forward, um, we highly recommend that you try this out in the new release uh, and test it out and uh, get us some feedback. Uh, we're, we're really hoping to, to make this really, really good uh, replacement that can do more than what the UI WebView already does. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. And again, that's the idea is we want to make your life easier, especially with the iPhone. Now, what's going to be great is in about, um, you know, three or four months, I, Apple will completely screw with us again. So we look forward to that. <laughs> no, and, and I'm wondering, is the going to even have that notch? This is going to be now, like a one-off thing with a notch, you know? <laughs> they're, they're, I think they're trying to put the notch behind the screen is really... Which would be cool. They, so you can actually, yeah, I don't know how they do that. That would be yeah, amazing, but, wouldn't it? Yeah, so like getting uh, a camera to look through a screen that's also presenting things to you. Yeah, it's kind of yeah, but they they got a lot of money to figure yeah. that stuff out. <laughs> they can so figure out the hard. If anybody can, I'm going to give them give well, the view of it, or they'll just uh, get it from Samsung and build it in. Yeah, I them. hope yeah. not. <laughs> <laughs> They've had a bad track record, but very cool. So thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate that, and also the help on the uh, checkbox stuff. Uh, oh, you're as welcome. always. It, you know, and let me go ahead and show my screen. There we go. Do, 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 do. Hang on, I might have to make you oh, the presenter. Yeah. You're the boss. You're the. Wow, the look at that. I made us all organizers. It's a very flat. Uh, oh, there you are. Great. Yep. So, as always, this is in the fabulous release notes. So I'm putting them out there. So this is a great way to, to keep an eye on stuff, the official release and all the cool stuff. As you can see, uh, new we're going to be doing more work in the very near future on Git, kind of showing you more how to use it. Sarah's been working heavily on the documentation of that. But you can see now there's some color coding comment. You know, So we continue to enhance the Git capability within the alpha system because that's going to be such a critical element for the you know, multi-developer uh, there's so many ways it's being used, and, and uh, you know we've kind of talked a bit about it in our DevOps series. Uh, what I'm finding very fascinating in the industry is that Git is translating into just a critical infrastructure component for companies. Meaning that you know you think of it as a development tool, and and it is, and it's primarily used with developer organizations. But most companies uh, are really driven around software anymore. I mean, if actually uh, interesting sites uh, was that. Goldman Sachs is uh, hiring more programmers than traders and financial people because fintech's so big. So the key is the Git allows you to control the process of managing all the code that goes into these systems, and it's super important. So we're seeing it being embedded and embraced in everywhere. I mean, the fact that uh, Microsoft bought GitHub for God knows how much money, it's insane. Uh, there's just a lot of energy that goes into that. So we're going to continue to tightly integrate Git into our environment so you can tap into these infra infrastructures and leverage all the power of the Git capability. So, uh, you know, I, this is where I picked up, um, I mean, there's some updated, this was the, uh, you know, updated uh, checkbox information here. But this has all, of it. and along with it, obviously, Sarah is working very diligently to, uh, fully flesh out the documentation on these new features on the two-factor authentication 
and other elements that are going into it. And if you're interested in what's kind of new, super new, uh, you can also go to our pre-release. Now, you'll see right here up the top of our release notes, we have a pre-release build. If I click here, this is where you can actually um, access that build, although highly recommend you don't use it in production, use it on a separate virtual machine or something like that. But uh, you can also, you see what's kind of the new stuff that's kind of being put in here. So uh, there's like a newer version of Node. Ooh, that's kind of cool. I think I asked for that. But it's because uh, there's some like new versions of uh, mm -hmm. uh, Node and a newer version of Chrome is now embedded. So we're trying to keep up with all that, some debugging. So you can kind of see the stuff that's in work. And as you can see, there's not much right now in the pre-release because we just had an official release. But this will give you a good idea of what's going on, where it's going on there. And very important, by the way, sorry, XP users, <laughs> you're kicked to the curb. <laughs> oh, I loved XP when it came out. I have to uh, you say. know, it when was. it came out, I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah. Although, yeah, I got to say Windows 7 was one of my favorites because it and just Windows worked. 7 is still, it was I still solid. Use it. And, yeah. I mean, yeah. my God, you can see um, I, my pre-release, sorry, I'm jumping around a lot. This is Windows 7, is what I use for my, <laughs> my pre-release ones. So uh, out of my cold, dead fingers, they will cry. I know. Windows I know. It's not going to be long. It no. won't be long. It's going to go. But my production long. stuff is all Windows 10, which is actually another good release. So pretty good. Yeah. But uh, I really want to, what was the one that was just a travesty? Windows 8, I think it was, or something like that. Or Windows yeah. Me. I want to, I want, I'm Windows really frustrated. Me. I'm very frustrated. Alpha dropped Windows Me support. It really just it hurt my feelings. You know, the Millennial like, Edition. I mean, exactly. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Too funny. Well, with that, I'd like to go ahead and open it up for questions. Wonderful. We have questions. We have comments. We have all kinds of things. Everyone was pointing out that, well, Flat Icon, which I also use and love, and I have a subscription to it because you can get more icon packs. Yeah. And it, pretty inexpensive i think it's a 100 bucks for a year maybe it's even yeah. less. i forget uh and i use it all the time it's really great um but someone had suggested iconfinder.com something that they use as well so just just another one in case you like them better there you go um another comment here is uh so you showed off that the checkbox thing that was cool but the first comment that came back on that was hey that column, man, that looks way too wide for a select column. How would you go about editing the style for that sort of thing? Right there, column width. I think there is an ush issue I that yeah. I think Sarah found. Uh -huh. um, so this is Flex. So it's going to essentially the way Flex works is that it, um, well, it, gives uh, it, even it evenly divides uh -huh. all the, yeah. yeah. So you can modify okay, so that. So that's where you can say, okay, so that would be, that's how you would fix that. Great. And this is the actual built into is the documentation of how all that works here. But be uh, wary. Cool. I think, um, Sarah, there was a, a gotcha in this one. I think you had discovered when you were playing with it. Um, yeah, I, I did. Um, and I was hoping no one would ask, but right now it's not really <laughs> following the column width rule. But you can wrap the template in, um, or not the template. I think if you go up, to a higher level and assign a class to it, you can override it in the checkbox selector settings on the okay. list properties. There's a, there's a property in there to assign a class name to it. And I haven't actually tried it out yet, but you might be able to, um, oh no, that's the row class name. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I think yeah. you guys might be a little stuck right now, uh, at least in the column layout. Obviously in a free form layout, you can set the width because it's a free form layout and you have to do that anyway. But with the, the list layout in in this particular case, setting that width, it doesn't seem to be picking it up. Yeah, and as you can see, one I, one of the reasons I wanted to bring this to everybody's attention is that um, obviously the grid components near and dear. It's it works. It's fast. It's there. But our goal is to basically have the list do everything the grid can do and more. And that's what's going on. And and there's a heavy drive towards that. There's some new core technologies that are being um, it's sort of baked into alpha over the next few releases that will allow us to do even more powerful things with the list controls. So, uh, and you know, I, I, if you start now, if you don't have any one specific thing you need from a grid, I would really try to use a list just because then you sort of future proof, mobile proof your, um, your application, because now you can make that list great, look great on a phone onto there. Also, you have the ability to do, um, let me go down here a little bit more. Uh, you can use the list for, uh, you can present uh, Columnar, Freeform, now Kanban, so custom and map. 
And custom is really cool. It means you can have complete control over it. And map, you can actually show mapping data within a list. So we're, really, this is where it's at. And if you can start moving towards lists in your application, um, grids are supported, will continue to be supported, but lists are really where it's at and where it's going. Gotcha, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> so a question was, um, back to the list box questions. Um, the question is, does the select all select does it really select all or does it just select the records that are currently shown on the page? I think we all know, have an experience like that from Gmail or something like that where you, you, you know, you do a search, it brings back a thousand records, 50 are displayed on the page and you say, check all. What are you checking? The page well, or everything? That's an interesting question. Yes. I might have to find out about it. On the grid, you can say, so check all single page or multiple pages. Uh -huh. So that gives you that element here. I don't see that factor in here. So currently my feeling, and I'd have to double check this, is that when you click check all, it's checking everything that has been returned to that list, meaning what's in the current list content. So meaning if that you would filter be the, the list. That would expected behavior, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but okay. I'd have to double check and make sure. We'll, we'll do a double check on that to get that. But my mm -hmm. uh, assumption, which is always a bad practice, is that it checks everything <laughs> that's been in the list or shown along with anything below, like on page two, three, four, five, et cetera. So I have a customer, uh, or sorry, you know, person here who's who's asking, uh, who thinks they found a bug in Alpha Anywhere, probably have. They said they upgraded to 12.4.6 version of Alpha Anywhere, but they get the following error when they try to do a push to GitHub. They get a, a script colon A5 underbar, git utilities, line 943, system cannot find the file specified kind of error. So my question is, and, and that sounds like a bug and absolutely should be reported, can you go through the process of showing how to properly submit a bug report so that we can fix it? Absolutely, and and we really do appreciate that. So super important is make sure you're you're on the, you know, the most current release because it could have been fixed in a release. Um, sometimes, you, you know, oh, go ahead. Go. There yes, is, please. there was a bug reported about the um, netrc file, and there is a hotfix available um, that addresses that. So I would try installing the hotfix first before you uh, go further, and that would be in the release notes, not the pre-release notes. Okay. So go back I think to at the, the top, there's a right. link. There it is right here. There it is, that hotfix right there, and it says that last one fixes an issue when publishing to GitHub if an existing netrc file was not found. And it says system cannot find the file specified. And Correct. Yeah. Like... So definitely try that out first. There it um, is, NetRC. Yeah. That's well. That's aren't you glad you asked? And I'm glad you were here, Sarah. So that yeah, that's the yeah, thing. Absolutely. Apply that hotfix. But Dan, if you wouldn't mind, can you sort of yeah, take a so process? because it's really helpful for us when you find some little thing that maybe we didn't test or know about, and uh, we we want to fix these things. Yeah. So you go tool. Oh, I'm sorry. Help inside uh -huh. the alpha development environment. And we actually have a item here called send a bug report. Um, if you click on that, it brings up a help screen. Uh, it has some quick in, in information, which is super important is that um, if you can include a test case, and that doesn't mean your whole app. It means like if you can isolate it down to a very simple thing, like let's say a checkbox, like the with thing on the checkbox, so you, you know, so create a little simple checkbox with static data in it and then try to, you know, that the reason we ask that is that it accelerates your satisfaction because it allows the dev team to have something they can just put under the microscope and, and they're good to go, you know, yeah. uh, so always very important, try to include a test case with step-by-step -step instructions. If you do that, you will get very, very nice responses. It will almost be and, you yeah. know, it's very quick there. So um, now if uh, the, and you'll notice extremely not a substitute for sending a test case. Uh, the other is that if you're experiencing crashes in Alpha Anywhere, there's like a dump file that will be sent out. So if it's like not a, like you have a UX and it doesn't render correctly or something, but if actually Alpha dies and, and throws up an error, it puts in information here, you'll want to go find this file included here. And it also gives instructions on how to do that here. Now, if I click OK, it's going to try and email me with my Outlook, but I usually use the browser-based email. So I click here. And what this basically does is that it pre-creates your email for you, including your versions, all the data, so we know exactly what you're on, what operating system you're on, 
And so you can copy this information to the clipboard and then go right into your email and paste it and then attach your test case and any other documentation that goes along with it there. And again, the better the test case, the faster the response. And uh, you'll see very good response because it just makes it easy for them to just get it under the microscope and find it versus having to create a test case. That uh, saves a lot of things there. Um, now, you'll notice that, again, um, this is my current version here. I am not on the full, like the most current release. So often they'll say, hey, have you checked it out on the most current production release or pre-release release? So, you, you know, that's where I run multiple VMs because often what will happen is I'll be in my, I'll find something weird. I'll go into my virtual machine, make sure I have the latest release, run my test case there, make sure it still performs, and then I can send it in from there. Always helpful because a lot of times things get fixed and they aren't always uh, highlighted here like you know certain big ones that are there are shown here uh, but other smaller ones don't uh, show up in terms of the release notes they just get fixed and rolled into it and you're good to go from there so uh, that is the best practices for submitting a bug report and again you find that by going to the help menu send a bug report uh, and this will open up and walk you through the process for here very cool. Thank you. Okay, now for something completely different. Uh, we have a person here who is interested in uh, downloading a JSON file, say from an S3 bucket, and they want to process it in alpha anywhere. And um, since they will have a connection, they can use either JavaScript or XBasic. But if you were working with a file that you were pulling down from uh, uh, S3 and you wanted to, I don't know, display the data or something like that in a list box, how would you go about doing it? So the cool thing about this is that there's sort of two elements. One is that you want to process that um, JSON. Um, in that case, you can use like XBasic scripting or other pieces there. But the cool thing about all of our tools now, so let me go ahead and go into, I'm going to create a new UX component here. And I'll go ahead and show you a couple examples of it. So the real question is, what do you want to do with that? If you're just presenting that information, one of the cool things about our controls now is, for instance, the list control um, is, I'll go into the setup genie, and I can go to the source type here. And, um, oh, let me, actually, let me take a step back. Let me go back and do this. I'll create a list, list JSON, and I'll open it up from here. So, um, as, as you can see right now, that you have different ways of loading that. So, for instance, JavaScript function. That JavaScript function can call and bring back that JSON and put it here. Now, obviously, you can put some sample data on here. So, if you're using JavaScript, you can call that, get that file, and put it right, in, feed it right here, and then this will just treat that like essentially like a data source, and you can put your fields in and do things along those lines. Another method here is custom, and what custom is, is it actually calls an XBasic function that can do the exact same thing. It can make a call, it can grab that JSON and return it to you. So that's pretty handy within the situation. In fact, behind the scenes, Transform is doing that exact thing. We've got a pre-built connector into it, but it's making an API call to Transform and grabbing a set of JSON and re representing it here. So your first step for lists are either a JavaScript function or a custom control here. Now, Dion, are, if it's oh, helpful yes. for this, sorry to talk over you, but if it's helpful for this example, I've placed a link to a JSON file, which has got customer data in it. Ah, cool. In the chat window, maybe we could yeah. work oh, on Yeah, cool, that. then I'll show you, that's we'll perfect. To the, yep. Got it. So and I, I by the way, I pasted this to everyone. If anyone wants to have a, uh, a sample JSON file they can work with, go ahead and use this one. So it, it's actually listed in the user's guide uh, for Transform. Mm -hmm. So another one that's cool, I like, actually, this one's even easier for Viewbox. Let me go open up my Viewbox here, and I'm going to go to Data Source. I'm going to set it at Data, but what's really cool now is, check it out, I have a REST API that I can call directly. Nice. So I put that in there. I put the API endpoint right here, and then if I have sample data, I can grab sample data. What's kind of cool about that is I can actually click here, and let me go through that a little closer. Clo or uh, uh, less Closer. quickly. <laughs> okay, I see. So I've got my endpoint here. I'm going to go here to my sample data, 
and I can actually go ahead and say, hey, make a call, and you'll notice it went, made a call to this endpoint and grabbed that data for me. So I have that information. So I don't actually have to create it by manually there. So I can click OK. There's a whole bunch of other things like if I'm authenticated and everything else there. Now that I have that, I can go to my fields and check it out. It's actually read that JSON and it's told me, you'll notice that there's kind of a hierarchy to it because we have the top level and then you may have more than one addresses, more than one company kind of scenario. So, so if you're looking to present that data, I would start with a view box because it's easy. Um, the question is, are you editing that data? Then we may need to talk about using a list and a custom data source kind of things there. But if you're just looking to present that data from there. Now, that said, um, we can also do the following. If you want to do, like, let's say you want to process that data. So you're not necessarily presenting it, but you want to process that. So I'm going to go to my XBasic here. I'm going to create new and I'm going to create a new XBasic script. So if I'm creating an XBasic script, you can do something very fun is you can go into a genie called the curl command to XBasic. And I'm going to go um, curl and then just put in that there and hit generate XBasic. And basically this is the XBasic that will call this endpoint and grab what other data is from there and show it. So again, you don't have to write all this code. You can just say good to go there. And then I'm going to go ahead. So you notice it's writing up. It's got the URL here. If you have parameters, you could put parameters in here. It's pretty easily. So I'm going to go here and go debug. So now I can go ahead and run this. And what it's doing is running this code right here. It's going to hit that debug once it gets the flag one. There's just a little lag time here. Okay. So what it did is that it set up what's called CE, which is a curl uh, extension. And it's calling this endpoint here. There are a lot of different factors, like if there's, you know, it's passing in like um, uh, uh, certificates and stuff like that. But right now it did the curl and it the flag means that it called it correctly. So now I can step through the code and what this is going to do is I can look at my headers. There's no header data. Now this is going to get the contents of that call. So I'm going to go contents and you'll see there's my content. It's the X, that is the JSON that comes back. So now in this variable contents is that JSON. I can now convert that to a pointer variable. I could do anything. I can manipulate that data. I could do anything I want from there. So it really depends on what you want to do with that JSON data. If you're looking to just present that data, then um, you can just use a view box or you can use a list control with a X basic command. Uh, if you're looking to manipulate that data, um, then you can actually use the curl to X basic converter to convert that curl command by, you know, this endpoint. And then now you have that content back as a bunch of string, and then you can manipulate that from there. So works now, really handy. You had mentioned taking that results set or whatever you want to call it, the the body, and turning it into a pointer variable. Um, oh, yeah. So to me, the breakthrough when I started working with this stuff was learning what the JSON parse command did. Yeah. Would you mind talking a sure. little bit about JSON parse? And the whole, and then I learned that it doesn't just exist in uh, XBasic. It's also the same in JavaScript. So if, once you learn that concept, it's uh, it's pretty useful. Yep. So the idea is a, a pointer variable is a um, basically a array type item. It, it puts it into a structure. So what I want to do is I'm going to actually, after I get the data back from there, so this is a string, uh, a JSON string, then I want to load it into a data pointer so it's easier to manipulate and work with programmatically. Otherwise, I have to do string scanning and everything else. So let's go ahead and run this once again. And that's called the JSON parse because I'm parsing JSON into a data pointer. By the way, we have the opposite where we can take a data pointer or a pointer variable and turn that into JSON, which is really handy too. Uh, so I'll go step here. And now what it's done is it's taken, you'll notice we have the string here of JSON data. I'm gonna go here and now you'll notice, oh look, it's actually broken it into an array. So we have 10 records. And so you'll see here are my 10 records. So it's taken that JSON and turned it in there. And then I can go down a little closer and see, oh, here's my address data. Here's my company name, et cetera. And you'll see as I click in here, 
I can kind of get an idea of, oh, it's data pointer, uh, row number one dot name. But if I go to here, you'll notice that, oh, address right here is, you know, address.geo and even down to the point here. So now when I want to refer to that data, I can do it programmatically by going down the pointer tree to find the specific information I'm looking for inside that. And data pointers can be multi sort of, you can have uh, parent child information, you could have uh, arrays within arrays. So it can take very complex job, um, JSON and convert it into something that's very easy to manipulate. And this is how I usually do it is to get a feel for it, I'll convert it into a data pointer and then just go into my debugger and kind of look at how it's structured and say, oh, if I want to get the uh, BS field, <laughs> this is what I would do to do there. Now, <laughs> notice we're on data pointer number one. If I go to data number two, it's a similar kind of scenario. You're just, we've got 10 things in my array and then uh, the sub data, it's uh, like 10 objects in my array and each one is referenced by an ID number from there. And with pointers, there's tons of built-in functions to do manipulations, to do searches, to do other things. So it becomes just much easier from a programmatic standpoint to work inside here versus being in a position to have to go in and, and figure out, okay, I've got this JSON right here. So I'll go down here. I've got to search through there to find the fifth record. Well, how would I do that? Here it's child's play. You just load it into the data pointer and say, go to record number five, give me their name and boom, you're done. Here you'd have to write a string parser and everything else. That's all built into it. And as uh, Dave mentioned, there are inside of JavaScript is the same thing where you can do uh, JSON. There's JSON stringify now, uh, but what's it called? It's uh, JSON.parse. I just did a Yeah, it's JSON.parse. And, and be very careful. There's uh, It's JSON capital dot parse so basically it parses a json and creates a javascript object so for instance if you have a, some text and then you do this then it turns it from a text into an object where you can say like object dot count object dot result itself etc so this is a standard practice and it's really handy and it's super you know once you get a feel for it, as Dave, and in the alpha world, the two things you want to look at, and I'm going to go ahead and put this into the chat window. There is JSON, oops, wrong keyboard, it's JSON underscore parse. Okay, so I will grab that in the permalink, put that in here. And so the parse takes text and turns it into a pointer. But then you also have the json.generate, which I will go ahead and put that also in here. That does the opposite. It will actually take a pointer variable and turn that into JSON. So you'll see in here that um, um, you've got a pointer variable called pj, and it has pj.text. Well, when you say json generate, that pointer variable, here's the JSON that comes out. And you'll notice that it, it handles all the things like, you know, the quoting for the, the objects and everything else. It can handle single quotes and other things along those lines. It's actually been very, you know, fleshed out. So you can do a lot of really fun stuff within it. Sometimes JSON will actually have built in um, JavaScript functions in certain things that go from there. Um, so pretty handy. Now, one other thing I want to show you, which is very powerful, is that so what we talked about so far is you are taking um calling somewhere and getting json down but often you have the opposite where you want to take some data out of your database and send it to someone as json either through a web service or things along those lines so let me go ahead and create a new little script here just to kind of give you a pointer here it's not meant to be exhaustive here but i've got another genie in here called the xbasic sql actions code generator and you can do one things to update a database, insert, or delete, but you'll notice one here, query a SQL database to get JSON data. So the nice thing about this is I can sit there and say, okay, I wanna collect Northwind, the table I wanna go to, so this very much so looks like creating a grid or something like that, and the fields I would like, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, select all. And I could set a filter, I could pass an argument, but here's my, um, my X basic code, I can sit there and click test and boom, it now calls the database, runs whatever filter it is, 
translates it right into JSON, and then I could spit that out and send that to someone or put it to a file or put it behind a web service where I can return that data there. So the beauty of this is that a lot, you know, JSON is super critical to the modern web. It's how data is being moved around in the RESTful interfaces. So it's critical that you have the ability to create JSON and consume JSON, which is what this is all about. Uh, beyond that, and very, very important, and one other real reason you really want to dive into JSON is the following, is actually, oh, you know what? Oh, did I not do that? Did I paste it? Let me see. Please tell me. No, I didn't know. Um, let me go like this. Actually, let me, I want to move it simpler, so let me go ahead and um, bear with me. I'm sorry. Let me go ahead and uh, recreate that real quick, code library. And I've shown this before, but I really want to hammer on a little bit more. Let's see, x page to actions. Let's go there. We'll select Northwind. Slack table is customers. Field list. Let's grab a few to make it interesting. And copy the code. Click OK, and I can paste it there. And let's go ahead and go show var JSON. Okay. So here's my JSON. I'm going to go ahead and copy that. Now I have that. Now one of the other key reasons about JSON is that nowadays, if I go ahead and go and as I mentioned before, when I was creating my view box here, guess what? The data source. Um, is can be um, uh, so I'll go to data the lit I can make it so it comes from a query and other pieces there so JSON is what drives these features and these these user interfaces and we're seeing that more and more I mean it's called JSON templating and one of the cool things about it is that this you once you kind of set it up you can create a layout to be able to show that information but we also have built into here the template tester window, which is built into it. So I can go right here and I can paste that JSON right in here. So I'll go ahead and paste that. And then delete this and paste it. Okay. And then here's my template. So I can just go customer ID break. Oh, I've got to put in a field. So I'll go ahead and uh, actually I'll do it the right way. I'll go menu, insert, Okay, and how come I'm not previewing it there? Uh, let's see, no, come on, show me this. Should be showing up over here. That's weird, that should be right there. The refresh thing. Mm. Yeah, let me make a quick change and see if it runs a fire. I should be seeing the preview there. So it must be something up. But the idea behind it is that since you're grabbing this JSON, before you go into building your user interfaces, you can use this tool to kind of lay out how you want it to see. And then you can copy your template from here back into your view box here, right here, paste that right there. No, no, that's the JSON, but paste that template and then uh, allows you to create quickly design your user experiences before we're doing there. And I'm not sure why it's not showing that there. Yeah, it didn't, it's not showing that. And I don't need any CSS. The wonders of running a pre-release. So that's why it's going on there. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so I just wanted to share that again, a um, couple of quick things just to recap is that um, built into our tools now is the, um, the ability to, and this will happen, you'll see more and more, is connect directly to like a REST API. So we're going to be able to do that more and more because we know that you're, and what's interesting about this, this could be a REST API that's within your own system. It doesn't have to be an outside. You could actually write a bunch of REST APIs within Alpha and then start building your user interfaces off those REST APIs versus directly to the database, which opens up a lot of really interesting opportunities there. Beyond that, though, we also have the ability, a bunch of genies, to be able to generate and consume it. And if I go back to my, uh, you know, so for instance, we can have this to call to a database and generate there. But then as Dave mentioned, using the JSON generate and JSON parse inside your XBasic scripts, you're going to be able to do that. And so very exciting, very neat stuff and a lot of fun. But um, 
I hope that gives you a little bit more direction on where you're going at. Well, thanks very much, Dan. So yes. we had two questions that came in, and they both have to do with data sources. Um, and so one person asked, can, you, can we connect to an ODBC data source? Someone else asked, can we connect to an IBM DB2 data source? And I was wondering if you could just go through the connection strings thing from the beginning and show yep. how we could do that. Yep. Go to, at your web projects control panel, go to tools, yep. alpha DO connection strings. This is where you manage your connection strings. Down here, I'm going to click new. I'll just leave a connection string too, and I'll click build. Now here is where you get to pick all of your different ones. So as you can see, we have a DB2 source right here, and we have an OData source right here. So when you select one, it's going to give you some heads and up. OD, um, sorry, ODBC was also the other one they were looking for, but I saw that that was on the list. So yeah, I'll go back and ODBC check that is there. Sure. Yep. The important thing is that certain ones like Oracle and this, they require certain little pieces of interface you know, code, like drivers. And so you'll notice that I don't have DB2 on this computer, so I need to install the DB2 client star. And this will show you and walk you through there from that standpoint there. So as you can see, it's not allowing me to go complete this because I don't have that software there. But if I go to OData, this is where I can then pick, uh, yeah, uh, you know, an OData source. You can actually pick the URL, the username and password, and whether you have authentication that's available there. Was it ODBC or OData? ODBC. Oh, the, okay, sorry. The old OData. one. Yeah. Let me go through. Yeah, ODBC is old school, baby. Generally oh, speaking, right now ODBC lets you connect to many of these same sources, but we recommend that you don't use it because the ones we have included are ones that we've written and run very nicely with Alpha and have been tested. Yeah. So feel free to use ODBC, but you'll probably find the native ones that we include are going to work better for you. All right. Yeah. And the other part, too, is that it depends on that. Like if you publish this to a server, well, that mm -hmm. server better have that ODBC source set up on that server along with yep. all the drivers or else things go bad. So mm -hmm. ours will make sure everything's kind of good. So you can see here, I go in here, I select ODBC, I've got my data source name, and then I have any other parameters here, and it allows you to then use those AD ODBC data sources. And I know people have used like QuickBooks as a, an ODBC driver and some other things that are kind of interesting yeah. allow you to access that data. Very cool. Well, it looks like we have run out of questions, believe oh it or not, gosh. before we ran out of time, but only by two minutes. So yeah. uh, thank you, everyone. Welcome back, first of all, Dan. Thanks hey, so thank much you. for presenting today. Thank you, thank Sarah, Sarah, for your super duper help today. Yeah, actually, oh, and actually, yeah, while Sarah's still there, we do have one question, one last question, so we can fill up the time after all. Yes, yeah, uh, good. And it has to do with documentation, and that is, is there a list, let me just see if I can find it, is there a list of the videos for the list box and the view box. Do we have a page that lists those out? Do we have a video library of some sort? Or if you were trying to find those, how would you go about doing that? Why don't we, uh, I'm going to address this question to Sarah, if that's okay. Sarah, uh -huh, I caught her flat-footed. Uh, there we go. Well, I guess, uh, Sarah, are you, are you muted still? I don't know, maybe... Um, got disconnected or something. Uh, there is a video library, um, which you can get to. You can also find, uh, we do have a, a various playlists on YouTube. But for that particular one, just send an email to guides, G-U-I-D-E-S at alphasoftware.com. We'll send you off the link to how to find that video library, and then we'll demonstrate it also for everyone next week. So thanks again, everyone who, uh, who dialed in today. Thanks for those who asked questions. Thanks again, Dean and Sarah. Thank we'll you. See you next week. Take care and have a great week. Bye-bye.